Welcome to the November 2023 edition of the CNS Journal Club podcast. And my name is Alex Suarez. I'm one of the PGY6 neurosurgery residents at Duke University with clinical interest in vascular and peripheral nerve and an academic interest in medical education. Today, we'll be discussing the article titled A Direct Comparison of Targeted Muscle re or TMR, and Regenerative Peripheral Nerve Interfaces to Prevent Neuroma Pain. I know at our institution, uh, in the last couple of years, we finally hired a peripheral nerve surgeon, and there's been a lot of institutional interest in pursuing the field, and there's been a broadening of what it means to be a peripheral nerve uh, neurosurgeon. And so um, in the spirit of trying to uh, share this uh, excitement at a national scale, I wanted to pick a peripheral nerve paper for, for this Journal Club podcast. We have an awesome lineup of speakers and guest interviewer. I will let them introduce themselves, uh, but we can start with the two people who did the original work. So uh, Dr. Sanger, if you want to uh, quickly introduce yourself, and then we'll go over Dr. Weber. Hi, my name is Jenna Lynn Sanger. I'm a surgeon scientist in the Department of Surgery Division of Plastic Surgery at the University of British Columbia. And I'm Christine Weber. I'm an associate professor in the Division of Anatomy Department of Surgery and the Divisional Chair for Surgical Research at the University of Alberta. Dr. Wilson. Hi, my name is TJ Wilson. I'm a, a neurosurgeon at Stanford University. I have a subspecialty practice in uh, peripheral nerve surgery, and I'm going to serve as the guest interviewer for this wonderful podcast today. And I'm Kimberly Huang. I am a tumor neurosurgeon at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, and I am the co-chair for the CNS um, Journal Club podcast. All right. Uh, getting started here, Dr. Sanger, if you could just give a quick uh, synopsis of the paper and some of the major conclusions. Absolutely. Well, first, I think um, on behalf of Dr. Weber and myself, thank you very much for honoring us with uh, introducing us and inviting us to join you on this podcast. The aim of this study, as the study, as the title suggests, was to do a direct comparison of outcomes for two very commonly employed strategies for the treatment of neuroma pain and phantom limb pain, which are TMR, or targeted motor innervation, and RPNI, or the regenerative peripheral nerve interface. So using an animal model, the first aim of our study was actually to look at, can we reliably create painful neuromas in animals? And when we go in and cut out the neuroma, are these neuromas going to recur? And the results of our first section were that yes, by six weeks, we can reliably create neuromas that animals have behavioral outcomes consistent with pain. And if we go in at six weeks and we excise the neuroma, we have found that those neuromas do in fact recur, suggesting that just simply cutting out the neuroma in and of itself is not enough to prevent um, a recurrence of the painful um, pathology in the animals. Which then brings us to the second part, which I think is the more interesting part, where we looked at uh, TMR, RPNI, and a control group where we did nothing. So using the same methodology as at the beginning, we created painful neuromas in a whole cohort of animals. And then at six weeks, we treated them either by performing a coaptation of the nerve to a motor nerve to biceps femoris, or we performed an RPNI where we harvested one of the uh, flexor muscles and used it as a muscle graft to create an RPNI or we did nothing and kept that painful neuroma in situ to act as a control. And what we found was that the outcomes in terms of behavior outcomes, as well as looking at the cell bodies for expression of pain markers were very similar between the TMR and the RPNI and significantly improved when compared to the controls. Uh, that's awesome. Um, by way of taking maybe a, a step back and everything for many of the uh, general neurosurgery audience, uh, a part of their, or it's not a large part of their practice to be dealing with um, TMRs and RPNIs. Um, do you mind just kind of defining those words? What practically are you talking about when you're doing those kinds of surgeries? Um, and lay kind of some of the foundation for the arguments uh, in the TMR camp versus RPNI camp for managing neuroma pain. Yeah, fantastic question. So first to lay out what the two different surgeries are uh, talking about, they're both based on the same premise that after a nerve injury, if you give the nerve a target, that nerve is not going to cause pain. And one of the theories is that a nerve that doesn't have a target, such as in an amputation, when you just cut that nerve, because it has nothing to do, it's going to cause pain. And so both of these strategies are looking at how can we give the nerve something to do? Now with TMR, the way that we give the nerve something to do is by we find a new motor target for it. So while you're doing your surgery, within the area where that injured nerve is, you find 
a motor nerve that's innervating a muscle that is intact. That motor target has to be functional. You cut that motor nerve and then you suture the nerve that's in question, whether it's a tibial nerve or the common peroneal nerve, you suture it to the distal stump of the cut motor nerve. And what happens is those regenerating axons will then re-innervate that same motor target, giving the nerve something to do. Now RPNI, or the regenerative peripheral nerve interface, uses the same idea of giving a motor target, but this time instead of doing a nerve to nerve coaptation, they're looking to put that nerve directly into a muscle graft. So that means finding uh, a little piece of muscle, it doesn't matter as far as we know at this point where that muscle is taken from as long as it's healthy and either wrapping the muscle circumferentially around the end of the nerve or like we did in our study, laying that muscle graft longitudinally into a nearby vascular source, so like a nearby muscle, and plugging the nerve into that muscle graft. There's no nerve to nerve suturing, it's just nerve into muscle, but the same premise um, is underway here in that that nerve is going to re the muscle target. Now this is, which one is better is a hot topic of debate and today there has been no formal comparison between the two. There are multiple um, different interventions and studies that are looking at that. Christine, did you want to add something? Yeah, so if I may, um, at the American or Canadian peripheral nerve meetings, it is quite a, um, a debated topic over which technique is better. And, you, you know, as a basic science lab and not a surgeon, I didn't have a dog in the fight for this. And Jenna, we've been uh, colleagues for a long time, and uh, she came up with this idea and she had the surgical hands to do it. And we had the resources to, to, uh, to support her. So um, I think that the beauty of it is that we really didn't know what we were going to find and didn't have any expectations. So it was, uh, it was a nice study for that. Sounds like the arguments uh, in Canada also uh, are in the United States as well at our conferences too. Um, Dr. Wilson. Just so people can have a little bit, uh, uh, I think, of a little better understanding of especially the RPNI technique. So you you use a free piece of muscle when when you use that technique. What why does this need to be a free piece of muscle? Why why can't you just lay the nerve into a nearby muscle that's fully intact? Great question. So the reason why that nerve has to be or that muscle has to be free is because you need that muscle to be denervated. If you take that nerve and plug it into a nearby muscle, all those neuromuscular junctions are already innervated. There's, that muscle already has its native nerves in there. By taking a free muscle graft, you've taken away all of its neural supply, all of that innervation. So those neuromuscular junctions are free that they can accept this new nerve and the axons that are growing into it. So one, one of the traditional techniques for uh, managing neuromas has been to cut the, cut the neuroma off and then bury the end of the nerve in nearby muscle or bone or some other tissue that, that is nearby. Um, in, in your study, you, you didn't use that as one of the controls. Was there any thought of using that as a control or in other experiments, have you done that and how did it compare? Yeah, we um, we have certainly thought about that, and we currently are looking at um, other experiments where we will be burying the muscle, uh, the nerve into a muscle. Uh, but for this um, project, it really was a head-to-head -head comparison of the TMR versus the RPI, and we didn't want to introduce um, another um, another cohort of animals. Um, and and alternatively, we we thought that this TMR versus RPNI, since they're both nerves that are trying to innervate a muscle, um, they were a good comparison because the surgical technique is different, but the end result of looking to see if the muscle is innervated um, could be directly compared versus with the burring, you're you're just burring the, the, the nerve and not expecting or hoping for innervation of that muscle. But yes, that's something we will be looking at in the future. One of the criticisms of the TMR technique has been that uh, there is a significant size mismatch between the two nerves that you are typically sewing together, and this uh, may allow for or even promote axonal escape and neuroma formation. Um, in, in the study that you performed, you used the tibial nerve as the neuroma forming nerve and then the motor branch to the biceps femoris as the recipient in the TMR. 
uh, how how does the for those of us that don't operate on rats every day, how is the size mismatch between those two nerves, and and how might that compare roughly to the size mismatch that you might typically see in a human targeted muscle reinnervation operation? So when we're doing the surgery in rats, yes, there's definitely a size mismatch between tibial and uh, motor branch to biceps femoris. It's about two to one to three to one, somewhere in there, which is very consistent to the size discrepancy that we see when we do the TMR in humans as well. So I think it's a very reliable um, methodology model to mimic what we're doing in humans from a TMR standpoint. Uh, absolutely, the idea of axonal escape has become and has been one of the criticisms associated with TMR. I can say anecdotally, uh, the patients that we've treated with TMR have not complained of pain secondary to a neuroma in situ or, yeah. And similarly in our animals, when we did the TMR, despite the size mismatch, it was not a concern uh, from pain scores. Having said that our animals it, it, in the figure of the paper, you'll see that there is a neuroma in continuity as um, one would would expect because there just isn't enough room for the, the the size discrepancy. But again, as as Dr. Sanger said, that um, our, our pain behavior tests um, suggested that that neuroma and continuity was not painful. You discussed this in the in the paper that you observed the neuroma and continuity at that nerve nerve coaptation side of the the TMR uh, rats. Did you see any neuroma formation at the nerve muscle interface for the RPNI rats? So we actually ended up doing the RPNI two different ways. The first time that we did it, we performed uh, what we called a burrito type of RPNI, which is very similar to what is being done at many centers in a clinical standpoint, where the muscle is wrapped circumferentially around the end of the nerve. And when we performed the burrito type of RPNI, yes, um, we consistently found that the muscle graft itself had atrophied away to pretty much nothing and a large neuroma had formed, which is very interesting. Because then uh, we reached out actually to Dr. Steve Kemp at Michigan University, who obviously is one of the creators of the RPNI technique. And he taught us the way that he's doing the RPNIs in animals. And when we used his technique, which is what we describe in this paper, where the muscle graft is inlaid in a longitudinal fashion into the muscle and then a nearby muscle, sorry, and then the nerve is plugged into that muscle graft. When we did it that way, we found that there was considerably less muscle atrophy and certainly less neuroma formation as well. So I have to correct you. It's at University of Michigan for Steve. I thought it. Oh, I get it wrong every time. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, so that was whether we published those results in a, in a different um, study recently. And so once we figured out the RPNI technique that worked in our hands, that's the one that we, that's the one we use for the head-to-head -head comparison that you see in in the neurosurgery publication. So one of, one of the reasons that you posited in the discussion of this paper that the neuroma incontinuities that form um, in the TMR rats, uh, why they might not be painful is that they're simply in kind of a protected environment, that they're you know deep away from the skin surface and they may just not be receiving external pressure to, to drive pain. Um, but when you use the more traditional techniques where you embed a nerve into just a nearby innervated muscle, theoretically, what you're doing is allowing a neuroma to form within that muscle. But those are painful, and it's still in a protected environment. So do you have any thoughts on why the TMR technique, you know, even though they're forming neuromas might be different than this more traditional technique of burying the nerve in the muscle? So um, we purposefully kept everything as superficial as we could. So we could, um, even with the, with the um, nerve to nerve co-optation for the TMR. So we could access it for the tap test for the behavior. So uh, even, so the neuroma and continuity really wasn't buried um, really that, that substantially. Um, however, uh, what's interesting is that we, and we want to look further is that we really don't know which types of this is a, the tibial nerves, a mixed nerve. And so there's going to be, you know, it's 80% of those are going to be sensory and then there's the motor axons as well. And we really don't know which ones are involved in the neuroma and continuity and which axons uh, extended out into the muscle. So I think that is a, an interesting 
subject to to look at further. Jenna, do you have more to add to that? I think it all really comes down to, we know based on what's been published about RPNI and TMR for that matter, that they do seem to help with pain. And all of the publications to date individually have looked at either TMR or RPNI and showed uh, good outcomes. But even though we're seeing these outcomes and people are starting to adopt these surgical strategies all over the world, we still don't really know how either one of them are modulating that pain response. Why is it that those neuroma continuities aren't causing as much pain as just burying a nerve if it is a cushioning effect? I think really to answer that question, we need to have a better idea of what is neuropathic pain because we still don't really understand that. And then what is it that these two different strategies are doing to modulate that response? Yeah, I think that that leads into sort of, uh, you know, the next question, which is traditionally when, at least when I think about neuroma related pain, it really is not one type of pain. They're really, you know, broadly speaking, there's at least two different types of pain that happen related to neuromas. And one is the phantom, uh, phantom pain that comes along with them. And then one is the more direct um, irritation or what, what I like to call neuroma pain. Um, uh, did, did you... I guess, could you talk to us a little bit about the the pain assessments that you did in this study? And were they really driven at trying to suss out the uh, the difference between phantom pain and this more direct neuroma pain? And, and were there assessments for each of those types of pain? Yes, that's a great question. So for the behavior test, for what we, we do is we put the rats in these little chambers that we usually put with a with a wire mesh on the bottom and kind of get them used to it and give them Cheerios and keep them happy for a little bit. And then um, for the, we can actually do a Von Frey test to, to test for the, the skin sensitivity, but we wanted to access the, the thigh and we had it marked where the, the nerve end was uh, for the neuromas and where the surgery sites were for the TMR and RPNI. And so we just simply uh, took a, um, a, a stick, basically a cotton swab stick. It wasn't that sophisticated and just pushed against the that uh, site on the animal and observed in a blinded fashion. We had a whole slew of, of students um, that completely blinded to the outcomes or the surgical um, procedures, I mean. And uh, we just counted uh, in three different trials per session uh, how many times the animals uh, guarded or licked or um, kind of uh, reacted in a painful manner to that stimulus. And um, so we, we in the methods, we were, we were quite ad nauseum in trying to describe it because it really was a relative, even though it wasn't that sophisticated of a technique, it was, uh, it hasn't been done before. So we wanted to describe it clearly so people could reproduce it. Um, for the phantom limb, uh, I'll leave that one to Jenna. Yeah, so our main aim looking at this was what we would categorize as neuroma pain, that hyperalgesia that you get when you, for example, have patients with amputations while wearing their socket or they bang into it or that, that pain directly in the stump that we would normally associate with a neuroma. Phantom limb pain is a whole other beast that, especially in rats, is extremely difficult to assess. We went through the literature and tried to find if there was a standardized way of assessing phantom limb pain, especially because we did not want to do an amputation model. We wanted to do just a pure nerve injury model, because as soon as you're amputating, you're bringing in all other types of factors, including inflammation, uh, wound healing problems, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, because to the best of our knowledge, there's no standardized way of assessing phantom limb pain in animals, particularly when the limb is still intact, we decided for the purposes of this paper, just to concentrate on the neuroma pain rather than the phantom limb pain. Has, uh, I guess maybe this is more for Dr. Sanger, ha has this uh, has this study affected your clinical practice at all? Or, or it, do, you, do you see it influencing your clinical practice? Or do you think that we still need a, a, a lot more data before it'll get to the point where it really changes what you're doing in, uh, in clinical management of patients? In my personal practice, uh, I have a mix of both TMR and RPNI, and I make the decision uh, intraoperatively based on availability of donor targets, the vascular uh, local environment, and um, basically what is going to be the best treatment for that nerve in the location as it is. So the fact that our results suggest that both TMR are, and RPNI are relatively equivalent, at least based on these animal studies, really makes me feel better when I have to do one 
strategy versus the other. I feel like both of them have certainly merits associated with them. And this is something that I talk about with my residents quite often um, because that's the most common question is why are you doing RPNI or why are you doing TMR? So it lends to a very uh, interesting discussion to hear their standpoints as we try to figure out what is the best treatment for that one nerve. And it's very common that I'll do TMR and RPNI in the same patient. Um, in terms of how translatable our, our studies. Well, there are multiple randomized control trials going on throughout the US and um, around the world right now. So uh, time will certainly be the one that tells us whether these results translate well into humans or not. We know that there, in humans, there's going to be so many other factors involved and that in humans, you have the luxury of asking them, does this hurt? Do you feel this? Where is the pain? How does it feel? And so the major limitation, I think, in working with animals is you have to base it a lot on your own observations as well as um, taking tissue, which obviously is a luxury we don't have in humans. They generally don't want us to harvest their dorsal root ganglia. So mm -hmm. you have a lot that you can get from both models. And I think that the ultimate proof will be in putting the two together. If I, if I just add, I'm so sorry. Can I just add for one thing is that the, I just wanted to point out that we did take the cell bodies, the sensory neuronal cell bodies in the animals and, and tested against different inflammatory and regeneration associated uh, genes and, and in, inflammatory markers and really didn't see a difference in the, in fact, we saw a decrease in um, the inflammatory markers and the pain markers in both TMR and RPNI, which is goes along with our behavioral studies and we didn't see a, a change in inflammation. I just want to say um, for our listeners, always um, good for them to hear about how different practices I think potentially are. So as a non-peripheral nerve surgeon, um, do, Dr. Wilson, do you agree with Dr. Sanger in your practice, your multidisciplinary group, do you also kind of use your intraoperative findings in order to um, decide between the two modalities or do you have a, some sort of algorithm that kind of helps you decide a little bit? Yeah, I, I have a very similar practice to what what uh, Dr. Sanger described. Um, you know, I, I generally favor in most circumstances the RPNI technique. I think it is faster. It's easier to do in most circumstances. Uh, and in, you know, especially when you're operating with other surgeons that uh, they're, that, that want you to move along <laughs> and get your part of the operation done. Uh, generally what's faster and easier, I think wins the day. Uh, my sense has been that they have pretty equivalent outcomes, uh, but it is, it, it is certainly not uncommon at all for me to do TMR, TMR and RPNI in the same patient, um, just as Dr. Sanger is describing. So I think we have very similar practices and approaches in that, in that way. Great to hear. Dr. Suarez, I think you have some great questions for the group. Yeah, take, taking a, a step back here um, and just talking about um, the patient population that deal with neuromas, can you comment a little bit about your uh, practice pattern, about how some of these people come to your clinic in the first place? What are the, some of the kind of clinical trajectories of folks? And maybe for a general neurosurgeon, what, what are certain clues that they may be dealing with a patient that has a neuroma there that they should be kind of referring to a peripheral nerve uh, expert? Yeah, so... I guess to back up a little bit even further beyond that, there's really two time points when these different techniques can be done. They can be done at the time of amputation in a prophylactic manner. And um, so that means that orthopedics or vascular surgery, general surgery, whoever is doing the amputation does their part first. And then the peripheral nerve surgeon will come in afterwards and do TMR or RPNI immediately following with the aim of preventing neuroma pain and phantom limb pain. The other population, which is what we were emulating in our study, are the patients who present with neuroma pain to begin with. And it's um, just like we've all learned in medical school, typical presentation is that of neuropathic pain. So uh, usually using a Tinel test, you're able to delineate where specifically that pain is from a neuroma standpoint. So they'll be describing uh, sharp shooting, burning pain. They might not be able to wear their prosthesis for amputees because it's too much pressure that's being put onto that area. Uh, electrical shocks is a common description that people will describe. And then when you start to do your exam, uh, it's usually quite easy to find where specifically that neuroma is just by tapping on there. And quite often, to be honest, the patient can point directly to their residual limb and say, it's right here. 
right here is the problem. So that's the neuroma pain. Now, phantom limb pain, we all know, can be absolutely anything. There's phantom limb sensations where patients can complain of, oh, my foot feels itchy, but I don't have a foot, or my foot is uncomfortable. And then there's phantom limb pain where it's my, my foot feels like it's on fire and they don't have a foot that is on fire. And um, for patients, uh, delineating between the two is certainly important from a clinical exam and figuring out which nerves you need to target by the strategy. But as far as our study and as far as all the other studies that have been done show, TMR and RP and I can help treat both of those, the neuroma pain and the phantom limb. So, um, yeah, I know actually at our institution uh, for some of these cases, uh, instead of marking left and right for laterality, like our peripheral nerve surgeon will literally mark an X right over where the pain is. So he knows where to, where to focus his efforts in the surgery. Um, Absolutely. Yep. So now, now as we're... Um, uh, thinking about moving forward, uh, you alluded to some of the randomized control trials that are coming down the pipeline. Uh, can you kind of summarize or kind of give the viewers a sense for what things to kind of keep an eye out for, uh, what may be coming down the pipeline in terms of those, as well as um, what you hope to see included, maybe as a primary or secondary endpoint for these folks now, considering the research that you're doing here? So there are multiple trials. I'm not even going to pretend that I know all of the ones that are going on. Um, if you go on clinicaltrials.gov, I think three or four come up right away just off the bat um, in the U.S. And I know there are many that are happening throughout Asia as well as Europe. So I'm not going to try to list them all. I'll miss someone and I'll offend someone. Um, but there, the main challenge with these randomized control trials, and one of the reasons why I think the animal research is so important, is because in order to really get an idea of the outcomes of these studies, you need such a long outcome time point, because we know that these neuromas aren't going to occur within the first six months. You're looking at minimum a year, two years, five years um, before you're going to know, did this strategy work or not? And so while we're waiting for those outcomes, I think that's where studies like this one are very important because they at least give us a little bit of a glimpse at what's going on. You don't need to follow the rats for two years. The rats won't live for two years. Um, the time frame is shortened considerably. In terms of what outcomes we should be looking for, I mean, we're doing this for pain. So I think that the most important thing that we can be looking for for these patients is the recurrence of pain, the severity of the pain that they're experiencing, and how well are they able to get back into their prosthetics, get back walking again, how much medication are they taking in terms of opioids and other forms of analgesia, and has that changed at all? Um, sleep patterns, quality of life, all of that. So, and, and the good thing is that in these next couple of years, while we're waiting for the outcomes of these trials, we and others can look at central sensitization or neuro or plasticity in the brain, or try to find the, um, the, the signaling pathways involved in, in the pain that's alleviated by TMR or RPNI, which, which type of sensory axons are innervating that muscle, which ones aren't, if the pain ones are not, if these cutaneous pain fibers that are now being introduced into a muscle, which is not their normal target, what are they doing? Are they just growing straight? And then they don't have that, um, they're not kind of balled up and, and angry and firing all the time. Is that all we need to do is straighten out the nerve? Uh, there's there's different types, subtypes of the sensory fibers. There's so much that we could do um, in the meantime with the animal models. And of, of those, which, which ones are your, your lab going to be tackling in the in the coming years here or what kind of projects are you most excited about uh, coming down the pipeline uh, within your within your research infrastructure I think everything I just mentioned but Jen I'll let you let you jump yeah no that's exactly it I mean my main interest is understanding why it is that we get neuropathic pain to begin with which is a huge huge topic but based on that what exactly is it that we are doing by reconnecting these nerves by giving it a target it's one thing to say yes we're giving the nerves something to do but why does that change anything and what specifically is happening because when we understand the mechanism of pain and the mechanism of what it is that we're fixing then we can look at the strategies that we're using and say well how can we optimize it because right now there's no standardization, especially when we're talking about um, prophylactic in terms of which nerves should we be targeting? Should we be doing all of the nerves, like all five nerves for a baloney amputation or are only certain ones more likely to get pain? Does this change if you're female versus male, the type of injury that you have? Um, all of these different factors are things that 
yes, these randomized control trials will help us to start to delineate, but the number you need to treat in order to really parse that all out is going to be large. Whereas if we understand the mechanism, then we can start looking at it, this all in animals and start applying changes in a human population so that patients, you know, now in the next five years can be treated more appropriately. We can optimize their outcomes rather than waiting 10 years until we finally get a better understanding. Cool. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, for taking the time uh, to come in and um, be part of the CNS Journal Club podcast. Um, and uh, thank you to all our listeners who tuned in for this topic. Hopefully we spark some interest in the peripheral nerve world. And for those interested in learning more, the figures one through four in this paper are super, super awesome and actually show the nerve coaptations. And so I really encourage our listeners to take a, a look at the actual paper itself because these figures are really, really neat. And don't forget this podcast activity is complimentary to all CNS members and is worth 1.5 CME. Please join us next time for the December episode. Thanks so much.